Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that every day British people drink about 165 million cups of tea. That's a lot of tea. What you don't know, though, is that that tea should be protective against stomach cancer, except it's not because stomach cancer rates are higher than they should be given that amount of tea consumption in Britain. And there is a reason for this. The reason is because of the British habit of putting milk in tea. It turns out that milk protein called casein sticks to the antioxidants in tea and coffee called polyphenols. And when milk interacts with polyphenols, it inactivates them so your body can't take advantage of it. So even though Brits love their tea, if they would just put butter in their tea the way Tibetans do instead of milk, they'd have less stomach cancer. That said, if you like your tea, go ahead and drink it. No one's going to hold it against you. Today's podcast is going in a different direction than what you're used to because it's actually me being interviewed live in London by Tony Wrighton from Zestology. What you'll find is a really cool interview. There was an audience of about 200 people, and we had more people outside who couldn't get into the venue. But it was a really cool chance to just chat about things that you might not often hear on Bulletproof Radio. So if you have a chance to watch this one on YouTube, definitely take it. And if not, that's all right. Listen up, and you will hear an awesome interview. Ladies and gentlemen, the founder of Bulletproof, the man who is a New York Times bestseller, and more importantly than that, He's got us all putting delicious big blobs of butter in our coffee. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Dave Asprey. Thought it'd be good to make the, make the entrance right from the back and make it a bit more dramatic. I, I feel like I'm on a talk show, this is awesome. <laughs> Um, did you realize how popular biohacking is in this country and in this city? I mean, we probably could have filled this three or four times over, and we've been turning people away over the last few days. Did you have an idea of how big kind of your movement and the movement of biohacking is becoming? I, I mean, I know it's getting big globally, but I haven't seen this much interest in the UK uh, so far. So thanks for showing up. I'm, I'm honored. It's cool. And this is our movement. Anyone's a biohacker when you start paying attention to stuff. So I kind of pushed the button on the word. But there's there's a lot of like personal work that people are doing. Yeah, the word and also, you know, I think any great movement has to have a good gimmick. Let's start by talking about the coffee. There's been, I think it's fair to say that Brits are slightly more skeptical than Americans in general. And there has been some skepticism. Is that fair to say in general? We're slightly less willing to adopt things. There has been some skepticism in the press. The Guardian said it tasted bitter and oily. Um, but there's a lot of people here who love it as well. Is there a sense that this is now almost becoming mainstream, do you think? Well, it was the Telegraph who said that the Bulletproof diet was everything wrong with America in a diet. So I, I thought that was a better quote. <laughs> <laughs> That's because the British press is very trustworthy and credible, right? <laughs> now, when you're a skeptic, it's very funny what some of the latest neuroscience shows. About 2% of the corpus callosum, that little network of nerves that connect the two halves of your brain, you have the logical side and the emotional intuitive side. Well, when you're a skeptic, you've taken the 2% of those that are really good for going back and forth, and you've trained them as a firewall to block any interaction between the two halves of your brain. The rest of us who are actually getting shit done, uh, <laughs> we've actually paid attention to those nerves and uptrained them so we have better inner hemispheric connectivity so that we can actually sense whether something is working instead of being afraid that it might not work. So I, I love skeptics because what you do is you make them a proper cup of bulletproof coffee, which means it's not bitter and oily because they made it right, and then they drink it and you go, how do you feel a half hour later? And 95% of the time they're like, oh my god, and 5% of the time like, I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> And I'm okay with either one for skeptics, right? Who, who here has tried bulletproof coffee before? Who here hasn't? Ha ha. Oh. <laughs> we are serving it. If you're a bit worried about being totally wired, then we are serving uh, decaf as well a little bit later on. As soon as our urns heat up. Um, what about bulletproof coffee for kind of athletic performance? Is that starting to take off? 
Um, I'm thinking, you know, obviously we love our sport here in the UK. Might we see the likes of Chelsea and Arsenal Football Club uh, following a bulletproof diet or at the very least, you know, drinking bulletproof coffee in the morning? This last, so, so I don't really follow celebrity people that much. Um, this last weekend, uh, I got a picture from the Bulletproof Coffee Shop in Santa Monica um, from this guy. I think he's well known. It was, uh, it was David Beckham. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he came there twice. He came there one day and came back the next day. So I know he's at least tried it and he was cool with having his photo taken. So uh, unfortunately, I wasn't there to meet him. And also, we sponsored the LA Galaxy, where most of the uh, UK soccer pros go. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I guess they're done here. <laughs> yeah, when they're past it a little uh, bit. But right, yeah. But it's, it's a start. It's American yeah. soccer, right? It's going to happen. Um, I mean, I'm thinking in terms of high performance. I know some of these endurance athletes now are switching. There. Obviously, 20 years ago, the thinking was, you know, you've got to load up with extra carbs. Muffins. And, uh, but now, is there a sense that the athletic community are following high-fat diets as well? Does that work if you're trying to break records, for example? It's still controversial. And... I think for certain types of endurance sports, you want to start out in fat burning mode, you want to be fat adapted, but you might want to switch to carbs at a certain point. Like there is a wall, but bulletproof and these kind of techniques, it moves the wall way out, but you can still hit it. So I don't have any problem when someone's like, you know, I'm on 75 miles of running. I don't know what that is in kilometers, sorry. Uh, but I'm like, I've run a lot, more than a marathon. And like, you know, I think I want to have some sugar now. Like, like, good, go for it. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. You might want to put some things that add exogenous ketones in so you can have both energy pathways going at the same time. I'm convinced that right now, brain octane, or in the UK, thanks to the regulatory people, high octane oil is the number one source of exogenous ketones in the world's diet right now because it's the oil that converts most quickly to ketones. So of course, athletic people want to do it. Now, big wave surfers are all over this stuff. Like, oh, I can get more energy per cycle of my, uh, of my mitochondria, which might matter when there's a wave holding you underwater for a while and things like that. So I'm seeing it in strength athletics. I'm seeing it in endurance athletics. But the mistake that some people are making, in my opinion, is they're going into ketosis and staying there forever. The cyclical ketosis approach that I outlined in the book seems to work better for mm -hmm. most people. And if you have cancer, and if you're one of those genetic people where you just love it and you feel it and you're never good on carbs, that's cool. But I think that that's the exception, not the rule. And it's obviously getting bigger, isn't it? I mean, you've got a lot of, a lot of people in here who come to see you today. Um, any plans to open a coffee shop in London? Oh, absolutely. I have plans to open a coffee shop in London. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be quite popular. Um, just, just one? <laughs> A couple of other London-centric questions. Am I right in saying you don't like taking the tube? Does anyone like taking the tube? <laughs> well, it's very quick. It's an easy way to get around. Tell us about yeah. your experience of going. So yeah. I have a, a unique radar. I'm one of the 28% of the world who have genes that make us uh, more susceptible to toxic mold. In fact, it causes mitochondrial weakness. Uh, in me. So when I'm in a, a place that's moldy, sometimes within seconds and always within minutes, uh, I'll feel it. I'll feel it in my brain. And I used to commute out here a lot. Like once every month for about two years, I worked in Cambridge. So I'd fly, I'd get a couple extra days in London. And I remember one day I took the tube to, uh, to go see the British Museum. I'm like, all right, this, this is going to be really fun. And I'm on the tube and I'm starting to feel really, really weird, uh, like seeing colors kind of weird. And I walk down this long tile dank hallway, you know, the ones with white <laughs> tiles on them that are just nasty. Uh, and by the end of it, I'm like, okay, I'm like, I'm kind of getting tunnel vision. So I'm like, I'll just hold my breath. So I'm, I'm like starting to go really fast. And I will say I was really not happy. And people who've been exposed many times, like I have to toxic mold, they know this feeling. They're like, I have to get out of here. So I'm kind of taking the escalator stairs two at a time, and this very polite gentleman comes on the overhead speakers, and he's like, would the gentleman charging the escalators please stop? And I'm like, charging? That's usually with a credit card. And I, had, I couldn't process <laughs> what he was saying, and I'm sure like I scared people running up the escalators, but I went outside and breathed, and it took like eight shots of coffee to turn my mitochondria back on because caffeine changes this thing called cyclical amp, which is an enzyme that helps you make your ATP work again. But basically, I felt crappy all day. And I can tell you, 
matter of fact that the air in the tube is absolutely horrible. Wow. And you've wow. got pollutants, you've got chemicals, and you've got this environmental thing going on because it's always wet, it's always dark. And if they did air quality monitoring in the tube, uh, no one would take the tube. It's that bad for you. My wife, Dr. Lana, who does a fertility coaching for global clients, including a few people who live in London, flat out, if you're trying to get pregnant, don't take the tube. And it makes a difference. Who's Sorry. getting Uber on the way home? <laughs> <laughs> just, just hold your breath. <laughs> Let's talk about supplements then, Dave. Um, I know you're not always willing to exactly talk about what mm -hmm. supplements you've taken, but tell me what you've taken today. Well, you, you just reminded me, actually. Do you, I need some water, though. I, I have a little baggie. Oh, we've, we've got your bottle of water here. Yeah, here. Excellent. So this is, is this, this is presumably isn't all of your supplements for the day. Now, when I travel, I do basically three bags a day. I need a spoon and a lighter, and I need a... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's see if I can figure out what's in here. There's quite a lot in there. I mean, it looks like there's probably yeah. 20 so, pills in there or something like that. Something like that. This is relatively light. This is live pill-taking on a podcast. So, I don't know if it's ever been tried before. Okay, I don't know whether it. we should ever try it again, but <laughs> we'll see. All right, let's see. <laughs> I don't know that I can tell you what all the white ones are. I know there's some aniracetam in here. That looks like a... Gamma linoleic acid, or no, that's actually a vitamin E mixed tocopherols and tocotrienols. There's an adrenal extract, astaxanthin, which is really important when you travel, brain octane capsule, which helps absorption of everything else, adaptogenic herbs, turmeric. There's an upgraded aging in here, and let's see, that's bilberry. I'm really working on eye health because it runs my family to get macular degeneration and because I have light sensitivity. So, what's that half a pill there? What's that? The half a pill right here? Yeah. That is one of two things. Let's see if I can tell you which one it is. Hmm. <laughs> it's either an aromatase inhibitor, which can, prevents uh, testosterone from converting into estrogen, which tends to happen a lot in, uh, in my family, just historically, as a guy who used to weigh 50% more than I weigh my body will always convert testosterone to estrogen more aggressively than normal. So I cycle on and off of these on occasion. It's either that or it could be cortisol. If you don't want to be jet lagged and you can get a prescription for cortisol, take micro doses of cortisol and you don't get jet lagged. It's awesome. Wow. Um, as you start to take your pills, I just, right. I just wonder. Just do it like this, watch. <laughs> no way. <laughs> it's, it's not that hard. <laughs> Did, didn't you throw it down your shirt or something? Did, didn't it's not you, magic. Didn't you learn how to drink a pint? <laughs> oh, I was never good at that, downing a pint at once. <laughs> it's the same technique as drinking a lot of beer. Good effort. Um, did anyone here recognize everything that Dave called out? Anyone? Okay. A few sheepish half hands. Come on, put your hands up. Just give us a proper... Yeah, okay, a few of you. That's pretty impressive. Quite a few smart drugs in there. Um, what would you say to people who are well up for taking anything natural, which is most of what you recommend. Mm -hmm. But obviously smart drugs are not necessarily natural in the same way they're chemical compounds. Well, nootropics. <clears throat> nootropics are an interesting category because they include natural compounds, but they also include pharmaceuticals. And in the States, to get like paracetam when I first started taking it, which is technically a, a pharmaceutical, even though in the US it's one of those, does not exist, the, it's not in the book for doctors. You go to a normal doctor and say, I'm taking this and they can't find it, like, like there's a blind spot. And they consider it an orphan drug in the US, which is funny because it's been around for 60 years and it's made by Sandoz Pharmaceuticals and it's anything but an orphan, it's a very well studied drug. It's just, it's impolite and it's actually not Puritan, going back to the US sort of thing, to take drugs that make you better. You have to be sick to take a drug, but if you're already well and you take a drug, clearly you're a bad person and you probably also have sex. <laughs> <laughs> there are also people that say, um, oh, I don't, I don't take drugs, I just get everything I need from my diet, I don't believe in all this extra kind of stuff, I just believe in getting the nutrients that I can from my diet and I eat well. And I, I kind of know the reply that you're going to say, but I wanted to ask you that anyway because I feel that's a, a common complaint of people who take a lot of supplements like you just have. Well, when someone says that, the easiest thing I just say, how's that working for you? And the reason they're asking me these questions is because it's not working for them. And sometimes you can say, uh, your pants are too big. Sorry. Like, like it's, it's not working for you. You could just point it out for them. 
Uh, you look like crap is another way you can say that. Uh, without meaning to be rude or anything, but you're like, hey, you're like, like, let's talk about this. But the real point here is, look, if you're only going to get your food from Mother Nature and your vitamins from Mother Nature, you should receive all of your toxins from only Mother Nature. No EMFs, no junk lighting. Uh, let's see. Uh, you should have no pet petrochemicals, no plastic, uh, no plasticizers, no endocrine disrupting chemicals, no coal dust, no mercury at the levels we have today, and the list goes on and on and on. Oh, and no stress, uh, like modern stress. So basically, go, go put on a toga and live in the hills. <laughs> oh, and by the way, you need to grow all of your own food because the food you're eating now has nothing to do with the food that would be coming from your own garden because a lot of it was picked a year ago and it's not fresh and it doesn't have the nutrients in it and it's been hybridized. So I would say that they're living an absolute fantasy. I mean, it's, these are hard facts. Mm. So you should counteract all the crap that comes into your body with just natural stuff. It, it's kind of like I like to run marathons wearing high heels with my hands behind my back. It, it, why would you do that? But you could if you wanted to. That's a pretty comprehensive answer. Um, what about in terms of people living in this city, and I'm keen to make it as London-centric and as British-centric mm -hmm. as possible. Um, I personally feel the cold a lot, much more than I ever did in my early 20s. I feel it might, like today, middle of summer pretty much here, and it's pretty cold. It's not a particularly warm country. Are there any supplements that we could take, firstly, to alleviate that? And secondly, I'm sure a lot of people have really been given pause for thought by what you said about the tube. Are there any supplements that they could take in terms of offsetting those symptoms? And the answer might be no, but I guess it's worth asking. Well, to stay warm, there's an interesting amino acid called L-tyrosine that upregulates your thyroid function a little bit. You can take 500 milligrams in the morning, and if you don't feel super ampy and jittery, it's probably gonna help you with that. Uh, green tea extract could make a difference. Uh, L-theanine could potentially make a difference. And anything that upregulates your mitochondrial efficiency or mitochondrial function is probably going to help with that. I would also say if you're cold all the time, have you had a comprehensive thyroid panel? It is so common for people to have thyroid that isn't working very well, even in their mid-20s. And if you go to the normal physician here, they're going to give you a test for TSH. TSH. Which is uh, one of seven different ways your thyroid can break. And if that hormone is okay, like, you don't have a problem. You're like, but I'm cold, and my skin is dry, and I'm tired all the time. Those might be problems, doc. So then you have to arm wrestle them until they agree to order a comprehensive panel. And like, oh, you're not converting T4 to T3 the way you should. It's not about a hormone issue. It's a conversion issue. So I would say if you're cold all the time, it's worth really digging in on thyroid first and foremost. Yeah. You may be able to help with just iodine. It's, it's really hard to say until you have the data. OK, yeah, I will. And, and I guess that there may be an adrenal component to that as well. There can be an adrenal component, and in Chinese medicine, they'll just tell you this amazing thing, like drink hot tea, green tea, not black in, in uh, China, and wear a jacket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's there's good there's actually a yeah. belief there that if you're cold all the time, especially when you travel, that it depletes you, and that you actually work better when you're a little bit warm. So one of the Chinese guys I work with who's trained with, like he can actually sit in the snow and like melt a circle around him kind of guy, and he's like, oh yeah, when I travel, I always have a, a jacket and, and a little cap to stay warm, especially on airplanes. I'm like, you can melt glaciers, dude. He's like, yeah, but I don't want to waste my energy on that. So you might just dress warmer. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> not quite the advice I was looking for, but <laughs> it's called wool. Yeah. <laughs> the ultimate biohack. Uh, what about mold? That was the second part of the there question. Is there anything that we could take to alleviate those issues? Bearing in mind, sometimes it's really the only way you can get across London, and that is to take the tube. Oh, sure. Well, what I would look at there is glutathione, which is uh, one of the major detox things in your body. It can be very, very powerful. If you can't get glutathione, just vitamin C could make a difference. Alpha lipoic acid could make a difference. Those are rate limited as to how they'll help you, but they can help you. I prefer, I mean, I make glutathione. You can tell I'm going to be biased in that direction, but I make it for a reason. And then activated charcoal, which is another thing that I manufacture, is shown, in fact, it's in the US military protocols for dealing with people who've been exposed to mold toxins. It's one of the things that can bind them. So does bentonite clay, and so does a prescription drug called cholestyramine. I don't think you need to be fearful because that's also not so good for your performance. What you want to do though is recognize, wow, if I get in the tube 
and I come out and a half hour later I have like really weird sugar cravings that I'm not used to. There's a reason for that. Those sugar cravings are happening because your body's like, I need to oxidize a lot of really bad things that just happened to me. I, and it's basically calling out for energy. So when that happens, this is gonna sound crazy, have some sugar. When I came out of the tube and had my eight shots of espresso, I was putting sugar in them. I don't like sugar. I don't even think it tastes good in coffee or ruins coffee. Uh, but I wanted the sugar as a medical substance to give me a short burst of ATP and it makes you feel better and you have to deal with the side effects of the sugar later, but it's a lot better than feeling crappy when you come out. You may also be like, I read the tube and I feel just fine. What's happening there is you're one of the people who has really good genes and you don't get an inflammatory response. Here's the problem. Those toxins, they cause damage to your DNA, like oxidative DNA damage. There's two kinds of stress for the body. What is called hormetic stress. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Remember the Princess Bride in that movie? You know, a little bit of poison every day so that you'll be immune. Mold doesn't work like that. Unfortunately, it causes damage. So if I'm the canary, I'm one of the one in four, and you're the non-canary, we both come off, and I might, God, I feel like crap. I wanna take a nap and I wanna eat a cookie. And you're like, what's wrong with you? Well, you're still paying the biological cost for the specific mycotoxins you're not paying the inflammatory cost that happens because my immune system recognizes things that yours doesn't. Uh, so you have an advantage, except that you're not aware of it, so you might expose yourself to it every day, which I have 1,200 studies on the website about OTA, the stuff that's found in coffee, and another 1,400 about aflatoxin, and there's a whole bunch of other molds. We know these things. Uh, there's a technical term. See, I always want to say bollocks here, but I don't know how to use it. Like, it makes no sense. That's but it, we'll say it, it, like, it, it bollockses you up. No. <laughs> See, I just use it entirely. But it's basically, it's bad. I'm glad you mentioned um, charcoal tablets, because one of the things that us, us Brits really like, we really, really like it, and our social life is based around it, is going to the pub. We do like the booze at most of us. Who here drinks at least very occasionally? Okay, who here doesn't drink at all? Okay, so probably 70, 80% of people do drink occasionally. And this isn't representative of the UK at all. Like, no, in, mo most, <laughs> in, in most bars, and, yeah, exactly. Um, if people want to go to the bar without feeling too guilty, what is the most bulletproof drink that they could have? You want good quality vodka. And you can have that with lime or lemon and a little bit of sparkling water, club soda sort of thing. So you don't want the sugar. And here's the magic thing about good vodka anyway. It's distilled and charcoal filtered, which means instead of having your liver and kidneys do all the work, you outsource the work to technology. And then you got the pure substance that came out as a result of that. So unfortunately, it's not all foamy and amazing looking in a big mug. I don't know how to make that happen with vodka, but uh, I suppose you could put it in your bulletproof coffee. And obviously some vodkas are distilled from wheat. Um, they say all the gluten has gone out of it, but some celiacs won't have wheat distilled vodkas anyway. What would you say about that? I, I recommend potato vodka for that, that difference, but here's the thing. 20% of people are sensitive to nightshade vegetables and potatoes are a nightshade vegetable. Uh, if I eat potatoes, the muscles all along my spine like get knotted up and my joints hurt for a week. Uh, so I generally don't eat them because uh, the nightshades family has these things called lectins. Many foods have them, but the ones that are particularly aggressive. And lectins are proteins that stick to sugars in your body. The sugars that line my joints are the kind that potatoes like to stick to. So when I eat those, I'm like, wow, I feel like I did when I was 22. Everything in my body hurts all the time. Uh, so for me, maybe potato vodka isn't a big deal, except I can drink either kind of vodka and I just get a little drunk from them because really they're highly distilled. Unless you're extremely sensitive, I don't think anyone's gonna feel the difference there. I, so I was, I was under the impression that um, tequila was actually potentially purer than vodka. I don't quite know why I thought that, but what would you say about tequila? Well, tequila is made from agave, which is like the sexiest new like vegan thing, like agave nectar, which is basically high fructose corn syrup for hippies. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but here's the problem. These are giant cacti. I grew up in New Mexico, like, like they grow right south of the border there. And there's something like 200 species and only one of them is really fit for human consumption, but they keep over growing and like over harvesting them. So they take all the other species that weren't even that well recommended for it. So what you're getting in your agave nectar, blah, and tequila, bottom line, it's not really gonna matter. Uh, what really matters though is, was the worm organic 
and I mean, like, at a certain point, we're, we're talking distilled and filtered beverages. The reason I say vodka's better is that they've actually taken more out in the distillation process because there's no coloring left. Not, some of the trace compounds aren't there. But for the average person, any of the distilled alcohols that are distilled and filtered, pick one you like. And you're going to be so much, so high in the bulletproof spectrum compared to, say, drinking beer. And I, I don't like that answer. That's just kind of how the biology works out. And, and you're lucky here. Red wine still has issues with ochratoxin A, the same stuff that's in coffee. But the European limits on the good stuff here are pretty decent. So if you were to drink like a dry white French wine, or even a French red, the limits are two parts per billion if they actually test the wine, which a lot of it isn't. But if you're drinking from a high-end vineyard, especially one that uses old world techniques, you're probably going to be okay unless you're allergic to yeast, which tons of people are and don't know. So if you drink wine and you normally don't feel quite as good as when you drink vodka, you're always going to have less biological work when you drink the vodka. Yeah, you, have, you cover alcoholic drinks in the Bulletproof Diet Roadmap as well, yeah. don't you? Yeah. It's actually a whole separate roadmap. It had to be that big. But really? yeah, it's, yeah. All, it's free on the website. Did you test it all yourself? I did. I went to, to university and I remember at least two or three classes. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually really useful, the Bulletproof Diet Roadmap. I, yesterday, was feeling great and generally considered myself to eat quite healthfully and um, stopped on the way to work at Sky and treated myself to some hummus. And within about 15 minutes, I really, I felt the inflammation. I thought, oh, I'll check the, I'll check the, the Bulletproof Diet Roadmap. And you talk quite a bit about chickpeas and how inflammatory they can be. Just, just briefly, I know it's quite random, but a lot of people would consider hummus to be relatively healthy. Why, are the, why is it so inflammatory? Okay, there's two plates in front of you. One is full of guacamole and one's full of hummus. Why would you ever eat the hummus? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I would say go for the guac. But the reason is that these are legumes. They're full of these lectins. They're actually different lectins than the nightshade ones, but for a lot of people, way more than is acknowledged, they cause problems. The other issue is that they have uh, storage and contamination issues. When you take something like a relatively high protein bean and you soak it like you would in order to make hummus. Well, what happens during the soak time? Normally you get micro uh, biological activity. You get bacteria and you can get a, a yeast or a fungus growing. And one of the things that isn't well, isn't even talked about in the wine industry or in the coffee industry, but something that I do test for is called biogenic amines. And these are things like histamine is a biogenic amine, and tyramine is one. You've heard of like cheese migraines, it comes from tyramine. So for some people, getting a little bit of that because you've soaked these things for a while, then you've blended them up, and then if you're eating it out of a container from the grocery store, after you made a perfect Petri dish, you got some bacteria and all from the air, you got some moisture, you got some oil, and you blend it up, and then you just let it sit there for a while. It's not surprising you get that effect. Mm. Same thing, you go to one of these like raw vegan restaurants, Here's what I always do when I go there. If I'm gonna eat one of those desserts that taste delicious that probably have agave and honey and like, all right, I'm having carbs today, whatever. But it's gonna taste good. You just say, did you make it today? If you eat that, you're gonna feel great. And if they made it two days ago and you eat it, you should expect to feel a little bit zombified and to have food cravings afterwards. And it's because of what happened between when it was made and when you ate it. And this whole like food safety thing, it actually really matters. Just one more question on food. Um, it, I think for a lot of people it would seem to be a small leap between putting butter in coffee and eating cheese. But cheese is just like, the, on the Bulletproof Diet roadmap, pretty much the worst thing. Tell us a little bit about cheese. Because well, I ate quite a lot of it last week and then I, I thought afterwards I thought, hmm, maybe that didn't quite agree with me in the way I thought it did. You could eat American cheese, which would be even worse. Like <laughs> processed what cheese is that? food. <laughs> cheese food product, it's called on the label. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. Uh, so that's just weird chemicals and whatever residue was left over after real cheese. But here's the main ingredient of cheese. It, it's casein, which is milk protein. That stuff is highly inflammatory and it does correlate with levels of liver cancer. And I generally recommend most people avoid casein as much as, much as is reasonable. There are trace amounts in butter. Some people who are truly sensitive have to have ghee instead of butter to remove casein. But when you minimize the amount of casein you get, you feel much better. There's also, like, like this, this is kind of what happens in cheese. You have a set of nutrients here, this milk, and you have some enzymes. And then you have some bacteria, 
and you have some yeast or some fungus, depending on what kind of cheese you have. You know, it's a nice blue, veiny thing. And then warfare starts. Since neither one of them has knives and guns and things like that, uh, what they do is they start making chemicals to basically kill the other, the other one. And then you eat what's left when there's kind of smoking rubble and one side's left. There's a lot of weird compounds in there that aren't well recognized. Uh, one of my favorite ones uh, is Roquefortisin. Roquefort? There's actually a mycotoxin called Roquefortisin, and we know it's bad for you. But like, ah, you can handle it. And actually, you probably can handle it. Depending on your biology, you'll handle it better or worse. But I have this crazy idea with Bulletproof that handle as few things as you really need to handle. So why do you want to handle that? It could be because I like stinky cheese on my salad, at which point, great, acknowledge that you're not only doing something good with the cheese, and all right, fine, I'm gonna deal with it. I'll take some charcoal, or I'll just be tired, or maybe I'll have no effect at all, because I've identified that that stuff isn't a suspect food for me. I'm totally fine with it. Most people I know who give up cheese for a couple weeks, they think clearer, they have fewer food cravings, they have less muffin top, their skin looks much better. You can see it in the skin, most of all. And it's a subtle thing. You're like, oh, I had this cheese, I feel fine. And then check yourself one day, two day, three days, four days later as different layers of inflammation unveil themselves. I'll tell you, I have kids and I live on an island where they're literally the cows that I eat, eat the grass from the front part of my farm. Like, so I, I'm as local as you can get. And maybe once a month, I'll make Bulletproof pizza. I'll use grass-fed local cheese and I'm still somewhat sensitive to it, but I can tolerate that reasonably well. But every time I do it, the day after, my thinking isn't as good. And it's not like my thinking isn't pretty good almost all the time now. I've dialed that in. I used to have brain fog all the time. I couldn't remember words. I'm like, what was I gonna say? Why did I open the fridge? Where are my car keys? All that stuff has become effortless for me. It just doesn't happen. Even if I only got three hours of sleep or something, actually like I did last night, I'm totally fine. Like I, I can bring it, but if I have cheese, uh, a couple days later, I'm just not, I'm 80% there, but I'm not 100% there. And it's that nuance when you start paying attention to, wait a minute, why do I feel like this right now? That really can instruct you a lot. No one told me 20 years ago when I started like taking notes on this, that what I did four days ago could have an impact on me. It drove me nuts for years. I thought I was fine on gluten. So I would eat gluten on one day, the next day I was really fine. But the day after that, I was really not fine. But to know there's a lag time when you eat cheese is, is kind of important knowledge that hasn't been out there. Now that's quite hard to track, isn't it? Um, yeah. I, I did want to ask about tracking. Who here tracks in some way, some aspect of their lives? Just put your hands up. Okay, so most of us. Who here's wearing a tracker? Not that many. Um, it's quite hard to track. As far as I've found, I'm a bit of a tracking geek. And I've, I've got a feeling my obsession with tracking isn't necessarily healthy. But in terms of being able to track something like, oh, I ate cheese and then two days later I felt bad, I've not found anything that does the job particularly well. Um, have you got any recommendations for tracking? There's a free app called Food Detective, and it's one that uh, Bulletproof developed. And it's free because it's actually important stuff. And what you can do with that is shortcut a little bit. If you're truly sensitive to a food, you use this app in the morning, it gets a baseline uh, heart rate, not heart rate variability, just heart rate. And then you tell it what you ate and you get your heart rate before and after a meal. And if there's something in the meal that you're sensitive to, it's going to raise your heart rate by about 17 beats a minute within 90 minutes after you eat. So you could use this, which is maybe less of a tracking thing, but more of a, a detective thing. And I advise people to track what you hack. There's something called the exposome. And this is a word that only was invented maybe seven years ago. This is a set of all the environmental things around you that you're exposed to over the course of your life. It's thousands of times bigger than the human genome. <laughs> because I have no idea if the planetary alignment really makes any difference or not, but it's something you're exposed to. And if you wanted to eliminate that variable, you might want to pay attention to that. So the, the idea of tracking can be really misleading. You know why cholesterol is so feared? Because it was one of the first things we could track in blood. So we obsessed about cholesterol, even though it turns out it wasn't that terribly useful after all. And I get these, these going back to the skeptics, well, you, changed, you, you can't change more than one variable. I'm like, that's a laughable statement. Everyone is changing tens of thousands of variables a day. You just don't know what they are. What path did you take to work today? 
does that does that affect your drug trial outcome? No one knows because no one ever tracked it, but it wasn't the same every day. Right, so this idea of only changing one variable at a time is laughable, and it doesn't work when you're testing supplements. Right. So you, you want to pay attention to that when yeah. you're tracking. It's better to pick a goal and say, what are the variables that I can think of that might affect the outcome, and just focus on that one outcome and change all of the variables that might do it until you get what you're looking for. And then you can zoom in, all right, I changed five or 10 things. If you were to try every supplement on the market for one month to see which one worked, two things would happen. One is you'd die before you tried them all. Uh, the second thing that would happen is that you would probably miss a lot of the things that are multifactorial. So the biohacking approach is, I wanted to change X, why don't I take every supplement that in a study can change X and see if I get where I want to go, and then back off. And my first several years of trying to change things biologically, there's only one variable at a time, and it's, it's a hopeless fool's errand. It doesn't work, and it's a lie to yourself because you're already changing every variable every day, you just aren't paying attention to them. And I tend to think that some of the tracking devices that are coming out now actually would almost have a detrimental effect on your life because of the lack of focus that comes from wearing an iWatch that is telling you every time you get a WhatsApp message when you could be going more in depth into whatever you're doing. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. So I was CTO of Basis, the wristband company, the first one that got heart rate off the wrist the way the Apple Watch does now. And Intel, um, <clears throat> Intel bought that company for $100 million. And I can tell you categorically that the type of information you're getting from those watches is very suspect. And really? it's suspect because calories burned. I wrote a, a post uh, naming studies. Well, 50% of the calories you burn have nothing to do with how much you move. So how are these watches doing that? What is useful is, did I move more or less than yesterday? Okay, that's a useful data point, but the calorie count is just pure fiction. It has no basis in reality. And if you look at the cost of interruption, I spent 10 weeks of my life with uh, electrodes glued to my head doing the 40 years of Zen program and things like that. I've had my own EEG at home since 1997. When a phone rings, you absolutely see, you go straight into fight or flight, you go into to beta, right out of alpha, right out of theta, all the places where intuition and creativity and calm focus come from. Every time an alert comes through, it basically kicks that part of your meat, uh, your meat operating system what I call the Labrador brain in the book, it, it says, look, look, threat, threat, what, uh -huh. And this takes you out of productivity mode, out of focus mode. So I turn alerts off on pretty much everything. I think I get text message alerts, but almost no one texts me, and I would turn those off if, if everyone started to text me. I don't get any email alerts, and if my phone rings, uh, I will get that alert, although I probably won't answer it because I'm likely on a call already. And when I'm not on calls, I put my phone in airplane mode because I really, like if you don't have an appointment, you probably can't reach me unless you're my wife. And it's just good for the important parts of the body to have it in airport mode, isn't it? it it's certainly not gonna harm them to have it in, in airplane Can mode. you just check, actually, has anyone got their phone in their pocket and it's not in airport mode at the moment? Just put your hand up, it's okay. We won't judge. Oh, but here, here's the thing, look where my pocket is. Okay, right. Notice my pocket is far away from the important equipment. You, you biohacked trousers, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag biohacker pants. <laughs> um, one thing I've asked everyone on this podcast is, what is one book that you would recommend that's had a really profound impact on your life and one tip for living with more energy, vitality and motivation? So one book and one tip. Hmm. One book and one tip. It's hard to pick just one book uh, because I've, I've read thousands and a lot of them are kind of boring biological books. But I'm going to go back to a book that I read when I was 16 called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. It's kind of a classic. And the reason I'll go back to that is uh, I wrote, they tell you to set goals and focus on them every day, like real basic biohacking stuff. Oh, wait. Uh, it's not biohacking at all, but I wrote this goal down. And I said, by the time I'm 23, I want to have a million dollars. Like, why? Because I thought a million dollars would make me happy. It turns out there's actually not much correlation there. No one told me that. But I can tell you it categorically didn't work because I didn't, I made $6 million when I was 26, but I didn't make a million dollars when I was 23. So, but still, I thought it was a good book. But no, it, it actually really affected my career. And, and I would just say if you're reading that book or any of the other books like that, the latest book that's worth reading is The Code of the Extraordinary Mind. It just got published by Vishen Lakhani. A really good book uh, that has some of that kind of stuff and some more modern stuff in it. 
what will happen is, is you can get what you ask for. And the same thing goes when you're tracking yourself. So if you're tracking calories, I'm going to eat less calories today, you're going to get what you ask for. You're going to have less energy. <laughs> Right? So uh, you just make sure that you're very, very conscious and aware in the language you use when you're mm -hmm. setting a goal. Because if you set a biohacking goal or a life goal or a success goal or whatever it is, uh, your body is stupid. And it might interpret those goals very literally. So make sure you run it through the logic filter as well as, oh, that's what I thought I meant kind of filter. What about one tip for living with more energy and vitality? Probably the easiest thing to do is to get higher quality sleep. And this is going to sound a little bit weird, but healthy people need less sleep. If you want to get good quality sleep, doing anything that makes your biology work better is the right approach. So if you need 10 hours of sleep a night, your chances of dying of all-cause mortality are much, much higher than someone who sleeps six hours a night. That actually is a symptom. It's okay that you're getting 10 hours of sleep to recover, but you need to start looking at that really carefully. And if you just have to have eight hours of sleep, maybe that's all right. But actually a need for lots and lots of sleep, unless you're doing something like heavy workouts every day, you're a professional athlete or something, there's something not right in your biology. So pay attention to the quality, not necessarily the length of your sleep. And that's probably the biggest thing you mm. could do. I'm, I'm sure I've heard you say before you only sleep six hours a night or less. Well, let's see. I, I do track that. It's probably the one tracking thing that I do that's pretty straightforward. What do you use to tra track it? Uh, I, I use an app called Sleep Cycle. Yeah. Uh, in the last 1,178 nights, my average time was six hours and one minute. It's, it's trended up by one minute in the last year. I feel like there's some sleep experts who would say it's not enough. Uh, do they look tired? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a little break there. Um, think of your questions that you'd love to ask Dave. Obviously, the bar is open for vodka and tequila, but not beer. Um, you can also, mingle at the back, we've got the stores. You can obviously um, go and collect your bulletproof goodie bag whenever you like. They're all at the back. Uh, but we'll come back in 15 minutes' time with the Q&A. Give it up for Dave Asprey, ladies and gentlemen. So we are ready for the second part of our podcast. Who has a question for Dave? I feel that this man with the, with the red shirt has been so enthusiastically sticking up his hand. Um, shout out your question and we'll go for it. I'll stand up and shout it out. Yeah, sure. So, so Dave, you talked about high performance. Could you say okay, so it's a question about low performance and how to react when you don't feel like you're acting optimally at high performance. And, and what's your or name? Can't. Or can't. Or can't. Yeah. My name's Yoni. Johnny. Johnny? Yes, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> Very polite as That's well. Right. Dave. Well, recovery is one of the highest performance activities you can do. So if you're post-surgical or you have uh, something you're working on, you have massive adrenal fatigue, the state of high performance you're going after is high performance rest. Sleep quality is high performance sleep versus low performance sleep. So if you are in a place where you hurt yourself in an athletic event or something like that, well, the exercise recommendations are going to change. And this is going to sound a little bit weird, but working out really hard when you're sick <laughs> or uh, when you should be recovering probably isn't going to help. So number one, back off. Number two, that whole thing about cyclical ketosis is really important you probably are going to benefit from having moderate non-sugar carbs at least some of the time. And there's good evidence for that. There are people who recover just fine in you know, pure ketosis. However, I think if you test them both, you'll figure out which one works very pretty well. And some of the supplement things are very different if you're dealing with injuries or post-surgical stuff. It depends where the surgery is. And one of the things, a lot of the stuff that I like, like turmeric, uh, vitamin E, uh, fish oil like DHA and EPA or krill oil, they make you bleed. Now, that's a good thing if you're four days after surgery or six days after, depending on how deep and what they did. But if it's right before surgery, I don't think your surgeon is going to be that happy when they poke you and you leak everywhere. Right? So what I think you want to do there is look at recovery and rest as some of the most important things where you can modify your performance. So those are not low performance states at all. Performance doesn't mean you're moving. It means you're doing whatever you're doing better. 
And at that point, all you're doing is getting unsick or recovering from a major trauma, which is a surgery or something else. Super stuff. Um, we've got three or four seats here and two there. If anyone's kind of milling around and wants to come near the, wants to come and sit at the front, you're very welcome to come down here. Okay, a uh, chap who's kind of perched on the, on the table thing over there with, with a black t-shirt. What's your name and what's your question? Thank you, I'm Francis. I was, how many times have you been asked? So that's Francis asking top three things for high performance. I, I've never heard that question. <laughs> uh, top three things to kick the most ass. I actually give different answers each time uh, because, well, you got to mix it up a little bit. Well, all right, this will be a fun answer. I've never answered it this way. But there's three voices in your head. And there's one answer for each of those. So the three voices in your head are there to keep the species alive forever. And if you were to design an animal that wasn't very smart, you just have to have these three things in there and you'll have a, a species that will go on for until a meteor strikes or something. The first behavior is run away from scary things that might eat you. Okay, that, that's pretty good. The second one is eat everything so you won't starve to death. And the third thing is have sex with everything possible. <laughs> to make sure the species reproduces. Now, this is the Labrador brain, if you've read the book. And these are the core operating principles of your meat. The very fiber of your being, that's what you're wired to do because you don't need your monkey mind in there at all to survive as a species. Uh, we could have all sorts of bad things happen and uh, well, we'd still probably have really stupid humans a while from now if we could just do those things right. So that means that the top three things you can do to perform better are to own each of those voices in your head so that instead of having the, uh, the dog that jumps on you and humps your leg and slobbers on you, uh, you have what's more of a service dog inside your head where it sits and it behaves and you put a piece of popcorn on its nose and it won't eat the popcorn until you tell it to eat the popcorn and it doesn't hump anyone's leg unless you tell it it's okay and it's gonna be fun and things like that. So it comes down to understanding those three urges are actually not you, those are your meat. And having that perspective really gives you the ability to, to say, all right, that's a behavior that isn't a weakness, it's actually a built-in behavior that's automatic. And now that I have awareness that it's automatic, I then can take control of that behavior and I can actually train my nervous system the way you would train a dog. And when you do that, you'll find that you can perform better at every single thing you want to do. And you don't even have to drink coffee to do it. And um, I know you, you mentioned heart rate vari variability. You did that today. Is that something that could help with that? Yeah, for the, the run away from scary things, heart rate variability training is one of the ways to do it. For uh, the food thing, all you need to do is get your blood ketone levels up to 0 0.5. And your, there's two hormones that change. One is called ghrelin, which is the I'm hungry all the time hormone. And the other one is called CCK, which is actually by Calvin Klein. And <laughs> CCK is the fullness hormone. So 0.5 is below nutritional ketosis. Hmm, can brain octane oil in most people bring your levels up that high before it causes disaster pants? Yeah, because brain octane actually doesn't cause disaster pants very easily. MCT oil does cause disaster pants pretty easily, but brain octane has a very different effect and it's much more ketogenic. So if you can get your ketones up just enough, there. The dog stopped trying to eat everything because it's like, I'm too full to eat everything. And stop trying to run away from everything because you trained it to sit. And then all you gotta do is deal with that third one. That's a longer discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what questions uh, have we got here? Lady in the front row, um, what's your name what's your question? My name's Kate and I don't tolerate caffeine very well. So the question is, Kate doesn't tolerate caffeine very well. She's wondering whether she can get the same benefits from decaf as from the normal bulletproof coffee. Yeah. I would have phrased that as Kate is weak. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Now, in most of the studies about the benefits of coffee, they're based on the polyphenols. Decaf works just fine. In fact, what I've been doing for about the last year, I was going to talk about this at, at the conference, but I've intentionally upped my coffee dose. Bulletproof coffee has different, it's called pharmacokinetics, which is the delivery system for trimethylxanthine caffeine. So when you mix it in with brain octane, with butter, when you blend it, you're doing all sorts of things that affect how that's absorbed by the body. It turns out that if you do that with just uh, normal coffee that's caffeinated, you're gonna want less coffee than if you drink 
normal coffee where you drink it and then you crash and you drink it and you crash, you drink it and you crash and do it all day. I could drink five cups of regular coffee because I had to, but I don't really want to drink five cups of Bulletproof coffee even if I'm drinking it black because it's just too much for me. So I usually have like two good sized cups of coffee. I have like one in the morning and a couple shots of espresso at lunch and I just pour brain octane on my food if I'm going to have lunch. And on a day like this where I'm traveling a lot, I might have two Bulletproof coffees. But at home, I'll have three more decaf coffees because the benefits stack up in studies from decaf. The problem with decaf is that even here where there are some standards, they're not that tight, but there are some standards around one of the 25 molds in coffee that I test for. They're twice as high for decaf coffee and because decaf coffee is always moldier because they would never use good coffee to decaffeinate it because it ruins the flavor. So when I make decaf, we use the lab tested coffee and then we use a Swiss water process and carefully control the humidity. The Swiss water plant is very near to where I roast. So we can do basically a high quality, low toxin decaf. I actually react really poorly to decaf coffee, much more so than caffeinated coffee when it's just kind of run of the mill. If it's really good tasting, you know, high end coffee, I, I get a lot of anxiety from it, like physical anxiety from the, the mycotoxins in it. So I would just say be careful with the decaf you drink but you get more benefits from more polyphenols and there's emerging evidence you need like two grams of polyphenols a day, which is quite a lot. And I actually can't tell you off the top of my head how many grams of polyphenols are in a cup of coffee, but it's on the order of 100 milligrams or something like that, probably depending on brewing technique. Good, great. Right, who have we got? Lady there with her hand up. Hi, my name is Natalia and I would like to so Natalia wants to know how to maintain positivity, or and you said a positive charge. I had to determine whether you were talking about like electrically grounding myself. I want to keep a negative charge. I'm right, sorry. How do I keep a positive energy? I, I get you there. There's something I do with my kids every night, and it's really, really important. What I do is I sit down, and, and they're six and nine now, and I say, well, tell me something you did today that was a win. And a win is something that you actually worked on that happened. And then we go, all right, that's, a, that's, that's awesome, like you, you did it. And then next time we said, tell me something that's a fail. And a fail is something you worked on that you didn't get. And then we celebrate that even more because that means that you learned something because you were pushing yourself. Because if all you have is wins, you're not trying very hard. So that completely removes the fear of failure from my kids because they actually have praise for failure. And I do the same thing with my employees, not quite at that level, but even in my own internal dialogue there, it's like, oh yeah, that didn't work, won't do that again. And from there I go into, what's your, uh, what's your act of kindness for today? And you find one thing you did that day where you were actually kind to someone. Uh, I met some, uh, some homeless person in France yesterday, she's at 11 o'clock at night with a baby. Right? You know, she could have been out with the baby just because she knows she'll get the most sympathy. I don't really care. It still sucks. So I gave her whatever, five, I didn't remember what currency was in my pocket, but it was a lot more than she was expecting. It didn't change my life, but it might have changed hers. Derek, I'm an act of kindness. I also tip heavy because, well, I'm in a place in my life where it doesn't matter if I throw an extra couple, whatever the local currency is, but it actually matters to the person serving the food. Or you hold the door or you put someone's luggage up. It doesn't really matter. Just you recognize that you did something kind every day. And then we do three gratefuls. These are three things that happened that day that you're grateful for, that just happened, that you didn't plan, you didn't strive for, you didn't try for. And I don't believe it's possible to have a negative outlook on life if you focus on gratitude every night and maybe every morning if you're feeling really crappy. Uh, if that doesn't work, heart rate variability training. And for me, 10 weeks of having electrodes on my head, doing 40 years of Zen style training, learning when I'm lying to myself, pretty much any time it's a negative thought, I'm like, there's my ego again. Uh, go pump that leg over there, ego. Like, I got shit to do. So you just recognize what's you and what's not you. And, and the negative stuff that, that you're recognizing because I'm not feeling positive, that's actually your meat operating system betraying you. So that's, that's my perspective. Awesome. Who next? This man here. Um, David, again. So you um, push a higher fat diet. And has, there's a lot of debate. So it's David asking about high fat and recent debate over. They bow you for yeah, that one. <laughs> I would say that the science isn't in on APOE4, but there's some really interesting discussions. When people talk about high protein or high fat, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, same thing as plant-based and vegetable-based. Uh, for instance, uh, my favorite uh, animal-based protein is snake venom. It's clearly, animal protein is deadly and you should never eat it. 
And my favorite vegetable protein is sarin nerve gas, which is actually a lectin. <laughs> and so you should never eat those either. When someone says high fat diet this or high fat diet that, they almost never talk about specific fats. And when they talk about high protein, they don't talk about specific amino acid ratios or dye and tripeptides, but that's actually where the metal hits the road. So I would say if you're dealing with that, look at your inflammation markers, which are really, really important. Look at the other markers that you're paying attention to. Experiment, but one of the types of fats that gives you the most ketosis, more than any other fat, is brain octane. So that stuff isn't going to have the same effect on cholesterol. In fact, it has almost no effect on cholesterol in the studies that I've seen. And you can push one sort of fat. Maybe you want to push olive oil. Maybe you want to push DHA, only DHA. But until someone looks into those things, I think it's dangerous to say you should be on a high fat or a low fat diet. It's actually high amounts of the right kind of fat is what I recommend for people. And even then, it's a pretty big range from you know, 50 to 85%, depending on what your goals are. Uh, but without lab tests for you, I think it's going to be a very long time before we can say, oh, this one genetic marker, ignoring the other like million of them <laughs> that are out there, uh, that, that we should, everyone should do this. I would say, well, this is a directional thing for you with APOE4. But what do the labs say for your own thing? And, and speaking of all of the genetic things, in about a month, I'm doing the, this thing called HLI, where I'm having my entire genome sequenced and doing IBM, you know, that big blue kind of data analysis stuff on it. Uh, so I'm hoping to learn a lot more very interesting things you don't get from 23andMe. Eventually, we'll do that for everyone. And 23andMe is the is sequence that will finding out much more about your DNA than you've ever been able to before yeah. if you're just a normal it, person. It's a partial sequencing for 99 bucks. Thanks for, for pointing that out. And the full human genome was $100 million that Craig Venter spent to do his. And now I don't know how much it costs because, well, I worked a deal. Uh, but it's still like pricey. <laughs> Has anyone done 23andMe? Yeah, useful? Just I'm waiting for the results. It takes ages to wait for the results. But. Um, good. Who have we got? Anyone at the back want to ask a question? I'm aware that... Uh, lady in the black. Hi. Uh, my name's Atia. So I wanted to know if you could comment on the effect. Great. So Atia asking about Bulletproof Coffee specifically for women and hormonal. There's a great blog post on this uh, called... Uh, something like Bulletproof Fasting in Women. And I, I go into a lot of detail on this. And my first book, The Better Baby Book, had an enormous amount about female hormones and fertility and things like that. So the people who are, are saying, well, you shouldn't have coffee because of hormones, are concerned about uh, cortisol from coffee. Whereas many of the studies, in fact, almost every study of coffee and cortisol is using instant coffee because scientists don't know there's a difference. In Europe, where there is a lab, uh, where there is a standard, it's much, much higher for what they call soluble coffee or instant coffee. So they're actually testing things they don't know they're testing. And it's usually not stored very effectively. It's in a lab, they, there's humidity, and it's not very well controlled. But they don't quantify what's in the instant coffee before they test it, because in their mind, coffee's coffee. I find that there's a difference, and that there's a likely difference in cortisol depending on whether there are compounds that directly attack the adrenal medulla, which mycotoxins that are found in coffee do actually do. So I'd say the purity of coffee matters and timing of coffee matters. So for women, I suggest protein in the morning, especially if you're having a hard time with your hormones. And you might actually need to not drink coffee or only drink decaf coffee. It happens. It happens with guys too. So there's nothing wrong with doing, say, green tea, but I know women who can't tolerate green tea either for various reasons. There are also weird things that happen when your cortisol can convert to, or actually when your, yeah, what's the one? There's an Eastern European one uh, where your cortisol converts to one of the, to testosterone, I think, if, if I'm remembering what this pathway was, it was completely bizarre. But it's one in 400 women globally have it, but one in 40 Eastern European women have it. And you run into things like that where it's very, very individualized. So if you're having issues with hormones, a high fat diet is a very likely good thing to do. Brain octane is a very likely good thing to do. And if you're like most people, coffee, one cup in the morning, maybe when you first wake up, if you wake up like a zombie, or an hour or two after you wake up, if you wake up all happy and bright early in the morning like those people we all hate. <laughs> <laughs> but at the timing could matter, and you might need to have it with food. There are some people where even if they put protein in the coffee, it's, it's not enough. Uh, but your mileage really can vary, and, and there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't want to do coffee, 
but I still would encourage you to, to play with Brain Octane and it, you can always use chocolate. <laughs> Good stuff. Right, who have we got? Chuck in the pink shirt. So Henry is asking, what is the optimal amount of exercise for someone to do who just wants to be healthy and wants plenty of time to rest as well? Well, the, the New York Times called me, quote, almost muscular. Which is, <laughs> which is the best quote ever. <laughs> because if you want to live a long time, that's how you want to look. You don't want to look like a balloon animal, no offense, because if you want to get swole, like, that's cool, that's biohacking, that's where you want to take your body, but your odds of dying go up substantially if you're carrying too much muscle mass. And that's an interesting thing. If you're too lean, there's another issue. Like going down below 10% body fat for men or women, it, it might look hot according to the, the current standard, but it is not the look of a healthy animal that's gonna to live to 180 the way I'm planning on. You actually need to be a little bit heavier than that, I'd say probably like 14%, as long as the fat is composed of good stuff. It's got adequate amounts of DHA and EPA and not lots of omega-6, things like that. It also is gonna depend on your own biology. Some people respond very differently to exercise. I can put on muscle very easily, it's in my genes. I was, uh, I had Andy Nilo, um, who's a friend who runs uh, Alatura, I had him up to the labs on, on Vancouver Island He's like half my age, I don't know, he's 30, but younger than me. And he's a cover model for Oakley, you know, dripping in veins and, and just absolutely ripped. Uh, but I outperformed him on the ARX machine doing chest presses. I, I, and, and he was pissed, you could tell. <laughs> just a genetic thing there, right? He's clearly in better shape than I am. Uh, so you have your own genetic differences. So I respond very well to weight, like weight bearing exercise like that. And if you look at what your body does, look at where you wanna be from a, a fat perspective, and do, I would say, the minimum amount of exercise required to do that, and then, and here's where it gets really weird, move a lot. And this means go for a walk. I use, I like the Bulletproof vibe because it's kind of like a walk, but in a lot less time, and sometimes you just don't have time for a walk. Uh, do yoga, like do stretching, but just don't count that as exercise. So take the extra time you have and apply it to movement which is neurologically beneficial. It raises something called BDNF, a brain-derived nootropic factor, which causes you to actually grow new, uh, new neurons. And you're gonna get the most benefit from that. Uh, you could probably, if you're younger, push yourself harder, I'm gonna work out you know, four times a week, I have extra time to sleep. You could, you could also meditate during half that time and probably get more benefits. Great, let's come down from chopping the stripey shirt. Mike asking about protein fasting. Haven't managed to find that much information about it out and about. And is it a good thing if you're training a lot? Yeah. Okay. If you're looking to put on a lot of muscle, you're training a lot to, to just put on mass, you might want to skip it for a while. But it's really important to allow the cells in your body to clean themselves out. There's good studies, I cited several of them in, in the Bulletproof Diet book. This is not something that's commonly understood. How many of you in here have tried one day a week protein fasting? Okay. Now, leave your hand up if you notice the difference from it. Almost all the hands stayed up. It is kind of amazing what it does. You're like, why would it make sense that I like, I'm thinner right here after I did that. I got the same amount of calories, I actually ate more carbs than I did, which means I'm putting in glycogen. Like something's happening here. And so as an anti-aging, high performance, I want to live a long time, I want to feel good while I'm living a long time, I think there's really a role for it. But if you're really working on a you know, protein bulking phase, so don't do it for six weeks. But at the end of six weeks, you might really want to do that because your cells are gonna, are gonna benefit from that. And it's, it's really tough like for the Hollywood people where they're expected to look you know, chiseled muscle with no fat, but they're also supposed to look good when they're 60. Those two things actually are opposite ends of the teeter-totter. <laughs> so uh, just be, be careful where, you, where you're going because you're looking for something now, but you want to look at the long-term effects of that depending on what your goals are. Because Tim Ferriss wrote about The 4-Hour Body, which is obviously such a famous book in the diet space, and he talked about a cheat day, didn't he, where he would just yeah. go out and eat absolutely anything. Is it fair to say that even Tim Ferriss himself might offer slightly different advice now? 
Well, I mean, Tim can speak for himself. Uh, he's putting brain octane oil in his tea and coffee. When he was on the podcast, he was talking about he was putting butter in his coffee. Uh, and he's doing more cyclical ketogenic stuff, which he's written about. That was one of the diets he talked about. It's one of the more extreme diets in, uh, in his book, The 4-Hour Body. So I, I email with Tim um, pretty regularly and I have a great respect for him. And I also think he just had Lyme disease, which he was pretty public about. And that also can affect your mitochondrial function and it affects your body's desire for fat and the amount of neurotoxins that are still circulating. So. I imagine that he'll modulate and change his program over time uh, for him, but I know lots of people who really benefit on this low-carb diet. There's nothing wrong with it uh, if it works for you, and, and that's the biggest thing about biohacking. Like when I saw it, I'm like, beans? Like, why would you choose beans for caloric density? That's why white rice is there, because white rice has less crap in it. But the bulletproof perspective is avoid the things that, that cost you and don't provide any benefit. And that's why on a cheat day, I used to do cheat days back in 1997, 98, when I was really trying to lose weight. I was like, okay, I'll do this Atkins thing. But the problem with cheat days is they cause cravings for four days afterwards. I don't want to deal with cravings. I have stuff to do. The cravings take energy away from you. And I have, I, I have no desire to ever feel a craving again. And if I do, it's my fault. I did something to cause the craving. Either I know what it is or I didn't. And I can tell you, that if I went out and I did a cheat day like that, my performance is gonna suffer and I'm gonna have lots of cravings. And I think that's true for most people, unless they're young, exercising all the time, getting lots of sleep and super healthy, but when they hit 30 and when they hit 40, the cheat days become more and more expensive and the recovery from the cheat day is an expensive thing. So I recommend something kind of similar. You have a high carb day to go out of ketosis, but you don't intentionally ingest you know, margarine, gluten, and all sorts of other MSG, like whatever fake colored like candy sprinkles on your ice cream, like those things actually have no benefit. There's no reason to put those in your body. The opposing, benefit, or opposing argument there is, yeah, but people like those, so not having to be strict uh, just makes it easier so people have more willpower. Like, my willpower equation is it's a limited thing and cravings suck willpower more than anything else. So I will do everything in my life to eliminate a craving. So I, I would say read Tim's book. It's, it's a really good book. Uh, I've read it and there's all kinds of good information in there, especially bodybuilding, uh, putting on weight, high intensity, kettlebells. Uh, if you want to swim a, a lot, total immersion. There's all kinds of good stuff in there. It, just different approaches and he does write about cyclical ketosis, which is the basis. It's like a low toxin cyclical ketogenic diet is what the Bulletproof diet is. Good, who have we got? Um, hey, um, my name's Abby. Okay, so Abby's been on the Bulletproof diet for a year and uh, finds at times you plateau a little bit. And what would Dave recommend for pushing through the plateau? If you're plateauing, one of the things that I didn't write around in the book that's really helpful is an actual real fast. Where, <laughs> please don't knock the speaker over. No, it wasn't that. I was starting to do the reverb thing where I was going to like resonate with power. It was going to be bad. So, a full fast, so 24, 36 hours. You take it easy, you want to do it like on a Saturday when you're not working and things like that. Um, that can sometimes be really amazing. It, it's hard at first if you've never done it, but that can help. And if you're in recovery it, it, from something, you know, you're, you're super tired, you're getting over being sick, don't do it. And for women, it matters where you are in your cycle when you do that. So you don't want to be like super bloated and swollen and cranky because, well, that's not a good time to fast. <laughs> Great, who else? Hello, what's your name? Hi, my name is Monica. I've watched your documentary, Moldy. Um, do you have any tips? Okay, so Monica has watched the documentary, Moldy, and is looking for tips on how she can clear her house of mold herself without calling in the pros. If you can figure out how to remove mold from your house without calling the pros, you will be a very, very wealthy person. Uh, it is difficult. Uh, you can buy commercial grade ozone generators that can break down some of the toxins, but you need to know what's in your house and you need to do a before and after test. I use uh, Homebiotic, the natural bacteria right, that comes from soil that competes with mold. And I, I spread that around my house as more of a preventative thing. I just had a big leak at the Bulletproof, uh, Bulletproof Labs up on Vancouver Island. My ice bath overflowed. <laughs> Happens to all of us, right? And it like went under the floor, it was really bad. 
So I pulled up some of the floor tiles, put in big fans, and like misted a gallon of homebiotic, which is way more than any sane person needed to use. Uh, and I dried it out though very quickly, so I didn't get any mold. If I did have mold, I would want to physically remove the mold. So what you normally do is you bring in contractors, you scrape it, and you don't want to be the one doing that if you're having symptoms. When we filmed Moldy, the documentary, uh, the whole camera crew and I put on these like spacesuits, you know, Tyvek, everything, duct tape, the wrists, respirators, and goggles, and the Kenny hoods, and, and all that kind of stuff. And even the, the camera crew who weren't particularly sensitive were completely zombified. They're like, we didn't believe you until today. Wow. So we went to this really badly water damaged house, and you see the footage where I'm like pulling off perfectly normal looking drywall. And on the back of it is black slime. You can't see it is the problem, but you can measure it in the air. So the first thing to do is actually determine there really is a problem by measuring the air and work with a, an inspector to tell you how big of a problem you have. And if it's a small thing, you may be able to do it, but uh, it's, it's hard to do. But I would look at things like ozone and uh, natural cultures to approach it. I don't think you're likely to get all the way well. Uh, one of the guys in the documentary, his... Uh, his house had been hit by one of the hurricanes. He was in the medical profession, and he hadn't taken out the drywall in his basement. He's like, oh, we had the house remediated. And I'm like, I'm not walking in the house, sorry. Like, like I will feel like absolute crap. But my producer, Kiki, she didn't know she was mold sensitive when we started filming the movie. I was, I was kind of guessing that. So she walked into the basement to look at it, and she came out, and she had a full-blown panic attack. As in, like, like, curled into a ball like I don't know what's happening but I feel like I'm dying and literally I had to just like hold her <laughs> while she like <clears throat> twitched. That's not an uncommon response when someone who's been exposed before goes into a moldy building because your biology is like oh my god there's something here that's going to kill me I don't know what it is but you feel it and well that guy was not well. He was not well because he didn't remediate it right so this is one of those things where oftentimes the best way to remediate something is uh, arson. <laughs> We've got time for a couple more questions. Chap in the black t-shirt, and then we'll come to the guy in front with the red shirt. My name is Tim, and I wanted to ask, what's your opinion on uh, hacking? Tim wants to know about hacking your gut bacteria. Well, I have spent uh, probably $100,000 on gut bacteria. I took uh, pig whipworm eggs about 10 years ago, which is one of the more aggressive ways of hacking the bacteria. In fact, two weeks ago, I took some rat tapeworm larva. Uh, I've, been, I've been doing those for the past like six weeks or so. I just did a podcast with Dr. Sid Baker about that. Um, they're delicious, a little crunchy, just kidding. They're invisible, it just tastes like salt water. But, uh, so there are things you can do. The vast majority of them don't stick is the problem. You'll get some benefits from Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a kind of yeast that eats candida as a fuel source. That works for most people. Some of the soil-based organisms can work, uh, primal defense, uh, prescript assist. Uh, there's some species of uh, Clostridia that actually fight Clostridia difficile that can make a difference. The problem is that in so much of the time, especially if you have overgrowth in parts of the gut uh, called SIBO, you're just not gonna get what you want. And most of the things that are commonly recommended, like, oh, eat yogurt. Well, lactobacilli can actually cause a histamine response. And I wrote a blog post, if you're interested in the gut, you have to read it. It's called, uh, why, um, why Yogurt Makes You Fat and Foggy. And I'm like, here's the species in yogurt. Here's the studies that show what those species do. The problem is, you have not a lot of knowledge of what's in your gut, and you have Within 24 hours of taking a test of what's in your gut, it'll shift depending on what you eat. So if you don't have an overgrowth in your small intestine, you would want to eat more prebiotics. If you do have an overgrowth, you'd want to eat zero fermentable carbohydrates whatsoever and maybe even take a, an antibiotic that's not metabolized to like kill things and then rebuild them. So it's very customized. But the one thing that I do know is, is very important is that the Bacteriodides family you can't supplement those, but they grow when you feed them polyphenols. And it's one of the reasons that, that brightly colored vegetables and dark leafy greens and say blueberries and what are the other two big polyphenol sources? Oh, chocolate and coffee. Those feed as probiotics, those kinds of bacteria. Now, soluble fiber is important. Turns out coffee has about a gram 
right? sometimes two grams of soluble fiber in a normal sized cup of coffee. And that's actually a meaningful amount of, of it, especially when it comes dosed with polyphenols. People don't generally recognize it. When you combine it with fat, like butter and brain octane, those are suppressive of bacteria in the gut. But if they suppress everything and then you feed the bacteriodetes, you'll shift the ratio of something called Firmicutes to bacteriodetes. And I've seen a few results from Ubiome and things like that that show that effect happening, but not enough that I can guarantee it. These are mouse studies I'm talking about, but someone actually tested butter and, and coffee in mice in China. Mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> Luba, so asking about technology hacks, what are the best ones apart from 40 years of Zen and what's coming up in the future? What can we expect? I mean, technology and kind of health innovation is just moving so fast, isn't it? it it's amazing. Both innovations happening and also our ability to change our environment is, is, is remarkable. In about 96, I was following all these crazy uh, brain hacking groups on Yahoo groups, if they even still exist, I don't know. And this guy figured out that, you know, if you shine an infrared LED, this is one of the first infrared LEDs ever made, uh, it'll go into the brain, it'll turn on mitochondria in a very meaningful way. And I bought this device, it was like handmade in a pill bottle. And he's like, don't use it for more than two minutes because you might cook your brain. But he had had such profound effects that over six months when he was marketing this as a, kind of a homebrew thing, he actually turned his brain on to things like, I'm done, I'm going back, I'm going to go to med school now. Completely changed his life. For years, this is one of my most precious biohacking tools because it made my brain turn back on. Okay, let me just be really clear. This is a freaking infrared LED. They're 20 cents, okay? I put it over the language processing part of my brain because unlike Tim Ferriss, who speaks like 15,000 languages and learns them in five minutes, uh, I actually don't process sound the way most people do. It's probably uh, something that's uh, uh, from just the way my brain formed in the womb. <coughs> something at the brain stem. I process sounds one level up in my brain compared to most of you, so you filter sounds out better than I do. It takes you less effort than it does for me. When my wife speaks Swedish or French, I hear blah, blah, blah. And, <laughs> and I try and pronounce the words back, and I don't say the same words they say to me. Like, I genuinely don't hear it. So it's really hard. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna hack that. So I put the thing here. I shine it for two minutes. And for the next six hours, I spoke garblish. I, I couldn't put my words together. I tried to speak and other strange sounds would come out of my mouth. It's a 20 cent piece of technology. Maybe two bucks with a heat sink and a power supply. That's interesting. There's a whole new wave of light-based uh, technologies coming out here. There's stuff around ultraviolet B which has been filtered out of this light. These windows filter out UVB. In fact, none of us receive ultraviolet B. But if you listen to my podcast with Stephanie Seneff, we need ultraviolet B to activate vitamin D to get vitamin D sulfate. And UVB has a direct effect on our mitochondria. Like it's part of our hormone signaling system. Infrared light is also important for that. So you're gonna see huge innovations in specific frequencies of light and what they do to the body. In fact, when I, I introduce some new stuff, I, I've got some new things coming out around that that are really cool, but there's an, a wave of innovation that no one's ever even imagined because we couldn't do it even five years ago. It's all LED and laser based. I used one of those um, uh, devices that shines light into your ears to have get over jet lag. Have the, you used the that? The human charger? The human charger. No, not really. I, I stayed up yeah. slightly later, but I still woke up early the next morning. It, it's a nerve. cool idea. There is a nerve there, and the nerves are light sensitive. And I've used a laser uh, on the nerve in the ear and on the trigeminal nerve that, that seemed to work. But I know people who love the human charger. Uh, the one that I found was more effective for me for just activating the brain is actually a nasal light. So, I mean, the human chargers look dorky enough on an airplane. Try sticking a flashlight up your nose. <laughs> uh, but they're actually designed for that. They have a little clip here, and there's infrared and a ruby one. And uh, those shine based on the base of the brain going up through the very thin part of, of the, the skull back there. So I think there are ways to get light into the brain, and that could be a good way to do it. There's debate in the, in the community. There's, whenever you innovate, there's always going to be these, these professional skeptics and haters who make up a bunch of crap. And sometimes they're right. But if, if their gut response is, is immediate skepticism, uh, they're just like fundamentalist, uh, fundamentalist people. Like they're, they're not going to think. that They're the people who always say no. 
And I tend to respond to them like I do my two-year-old who also always says no. They're like, good for you. And then you go about your business. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Who's got a really good question? No pressure. You seem confident. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a bit sciencey kind of. Um, sciencey. Yeah, we might have one more afterwards. But. <laughs> My name is Christian, and uh, I was wondering to get back to the APO4. This is a really good question for Christian, by the way, guys, trust me. <laughs> no, it's going in depth, isn't it, with, with fat again, coming back to fat and how, how, it, how we deal with it and process it. Well, your, your supposition there that if you, eat any, if you have APOE4 and you eat any kind of saturated fat, their LDL particles will go up. That is not a true statement. A saturated fat includes C8 and C10 oils, which are technically saturated, but do not behave like saturated fats. Unlike the other MCT oils that are saturated and do behave like long chain fats. That's one of the reasons I recommend the stuff that I do versus MCT, which includes some things that, that behave like long chain fats. So what I think you mean is if you eat a long chain saturated fat, your LDL particle count will go up. Now, if those go up, but your HDL also goes up, your triglycerides drops, your homocysteine drops, your LPPLA2 drops, and your C-reactive protein drops, does that not play into the overall risk equation that we get from looking at LDLC? It does, because if the LDLC is damaging your arteries, by definition, you'll have an enzyme, LPPLA2 is the enzyme, that will be expressed from the damaging of your arteries. So if you're you're worried about that, and I tend to think there's, there's, I know some people who are very focused on that. Look for LPPLA2. If you have damage, you have damage. If you have high LDL and you don't have damage, did you know high LDL makes it easier to put on muscles? It makes you more resilient to certain kinds of poisoning. It, there are actually benefits to LDL. It, it's not a bad thing as long as there isn't inflammation and damage. So, like, show me the evidence. If you have APOE4, you have high LDL, Show me that it's causing damage. Then you need to change. Good stuff. Thank you, Christian. Right, one more. Who have we got? <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, I have a nine-month baby. Jenny, so just to repeat the question for everyone listening and everyone here, um, you've got two kids under the age of three, yeah. and you're wondering what to feed them for breakfast yes. and kind of what the levels of protein and fat and carbs and everything else should be. Kids benefit from a few more carbs than adults. I don't give my kids carbs, I don't give them many carbs in the morning, especially fruit, because it turns them into whiny, cranky pants. They get protein and fat in the morning, cucumber if they want, and some veggies. And at lunch, they may or may not have bulletproof style carbs, not sugary things. And then at dinner, there's usually carbs. So timing seems to matter, and this really affects their behavior. They each get an espresso cup, uh, full of bulletproof coffee made with lots of brain octane and some collagen and that really helps them stay calm and focused because the, their little meat operating systems which say something like eat everything especially if it's sugar um, they shut the hell up and then the kids can focus on being kids and playing and not hitting each other and things like that uh, that's a big benefit for a variety uh, avocados can be really good and uh, there's a ton of things you can do with with vegetables and you really want to work vegetables in so it, it's your meat and fat's good, but the, the prototype meal for the Bulletproof Diet is cover a plate in vegetables, add a moderate amount of high quality protein from animals, and then cover it in fat. <laughs> <laughs> but if you skip the veggies, it doesn't work as well. So for kids, the magic is steam the veggies, take a third of the veggies, toss them in the blender, butter, brain octane, collagen if you want, a little bit of vinegar, some spices, whatever you wanna teach them to like later in life, some salt, blend the crap out of it till it's creamy and like really good, and then spoon it back over the veggies. Even kids who don't eat vegetables that come to visit our house, they take one bite of that and they're like, give me more. <laughs> so that becomes one of the primary things on their plate. And then you can add in whatever the protein is. And you'll find that kids thrive on that because they get way more fat in that way and it gets them to get their veggies in every day. So you do that for breakfast too? Then? Absolutely, especially if you're running out of variety. Yeah, and so you wouldn't feed porridge. I mean, so what I've done sometimes when I have fed porridge is give a bit of butter and, and, and uh, coconut oil and then I kind of not sure that. You, if you're doing porridge, I would definitely include the fat. Kids, they do not do well on straight carbs. And I'm a fan of the rice porridges versus the oatmeal ones. That there are lots of problems with oatmeal, but if, if it really works for you and, and for uh, for your kids, oatmeal's fine. Just get organic. It's really important, especially if it's not grown here. 
uh, American oats are terrible. But ideally, actually, move away from that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, by the way, my kids eat like mochi, like white puffed rice. You like you, you bake it. It's interesting if you made porridge or rice, and then you refrigerate it. It forms a lot of resistant starch. And one of the reasons sushi is good, you get resistant starch and cooked in cooled rice. So same even with porridge, if you cook and cool it, it totally changes the amount of beneficial probiotic starch in there, prebiotic starch. Uh, so that's kind of a neat trick. Awesome, Dave, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, it's been brilliant. Thank you all for coming. The podcast will be published this weekend. Give it up for Dave Astor. Bulletproof conference last year and then there's kind of been a bit of a partnership going between my podcast and Dave's podcast and I ended up being an ambassador for his company and so I knew he was over in Europe he's, he's been at the Cannes Film Festival and I was like look get him to come to London I know that people love him here and I think he should realize how many people are into what he does Really, really enjoying it. I'm a big fan of Vestology, big fan of Dave Asprey, so when the two combined, I knew I had to be here. Yeah, I think it's just been a great eye-opener. You know, having this event here is just brilliant because you know, Dave is one of those gurus out there that knows a lot about health and how to actually really uh, but actually bi biohack your body as well. This is live pill taking on a podcast. So, I don't know if it's ever been tried before. I don't know whether we should ever try it again. We've been talking to him about mold on the tube, what booze we should have when we go to the pub, which is a little bit more bulletproof than everything else, um, what the future of biohacking is, and then a few personal questions that I wanted to know as well, like is cheese good for us, and what about hummus? So yeah, it's been good. Did you have an idea of how big you know, your movement and the movement of biohacking is becoming? I mean, I know it's getting big globally, but I haven't seen this much interest in the UK uh, so far. So thanks for showing up. I'm, I'm honored. Give it up for Dave Asprey, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of people here, an awful lot of people here. Very positive feedback from the from the audience to Dave, and uh, I think it went very well. Everybody really loved the energy. Dave was so inspiring and so authentic. I think everybody really appreciated the uh, wealth of information that he brought today. So we'll see you at the next one, for sure. Absolutely.